Thank you, Minister, for your presence today in Geneva, a city which has hosted many negotiations about peaceful settlements of international crisis and at WIPO, a key international organization. And thank you for this dialogue with the GCSP. The title, as Thomas said, that you have chosen for this dialogue is Global Tectonics, the Indian view of a world in turn. Well, I think that we all agree that we are at a time of deconstruction of the world order. And as a European, <clears throat> I would say that three developments are at the core of this deconstruction. Number one, the return of war in Europe for the first time since the Second World War with uh, the Russian aggression against Ukraine. Number two, the new Cold War, this time between the US and China. And number three, the return of an online movement called today the Global South, which practices multi-alignment more than non-alignment. Mr. Minister, India is certainly now a key economic and political actor in this new world. How would you describe its transformation? And in this new context, what is, in your view, the role of India? And again, it's a great honor to be with you this morning and a great pleasure to welcome you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, and uh, thank all of you uh, for turning up this morning. Uh, um, in a way, uh, perhaps uh, this is a good subject to discuss in Geneva, because uh, if we talk about the future of the global order, we talk about the changes, the challenges, the prospects, uh, this is a city where perhaps the which has done more than any other to really try to construct, uh, sometimes not entirely successfully, uh, what is a world, world order, however imperfect that might be. Uh, and the fact that it hosts so many UN organizations itself is a testimony to those efforts. And I think uh, it's absolutely the right place to have that conversation. Uh, Ambassador, you mentioned three things you spoke about the return of war in Europe. Uh, you spoke about a competition, a great power competition. Uh, and uh, you called non-alignment, we call, I mean, there is a non-aligned moment, uh, you know, there's still a non-alignment group, non-aligned group. Uh, but I think the Global South is a little bit different. I'd be happy to speak to you about it. But I think you're describing the symptoms. Those are not the causes. Uh, what are the causes? I mean, first of all, uh, when the UN, which you can take as the current uh, sort of uh, architecture to the extent there is one. Uh, when the UN was founded, it had about 50 members. Okay. Today you have 193. Now, if the shareholders of any enterprise have gone up four times, how can that remain static? You know, how can it remain in the same position? Now, it's not just that the number of UN members or independent countries <clears throat> have grown. Their relative weight has also grown. That if you look at what were the top 20 economies, let us say in 1945, and then track it every 10 years, you would see uh, a big change. And I think the sharpest change uh, that we have seen in our lifetime is that of China. And the next one, which is coming, is India, because uh, barely 10 years ago, India was the 10th largest economy. Today, it is fifth, and probably by the end of the decade, probably be third. Uh, so if the weight, uh, you know, if the numbers have grown, if the relative weight has changed, with that, the balances have changed. Uh, and then in certain cases, relatively, there's a, uh, I would say, uh, a contraction as well. I mean, the United States, to name the most obvious example, does not have the dominance which it did 
in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. It doesn't have, uh, in many ways, the relative capabilities. And most of all, it doesn't have the appetite. So what you have is a world where uh, uh, those who did more are doing less. In many cases, those who have risen faster are not necessarily plugging in the gaps which have been created. Uh, the number of variables itself has increased. Uh, many situations, tensions have become more regional. And, you know, uh, uh, often the world order says, let the kind of people involved handle it by themselves. And sometimes in this tussle, uh, you know, big forces have been set into motion. So if you look at the return of war, uh, to your Europe, it didn't happen overnight in February of 2022. I mean, there were a whole set of events which eventually led to it. If you look today uh, at the competition, uh, uh, especially between the US and China, uh, it is in many ways a competition for global premise. So, uh, and when you look at uh, the reaction of many other countries, especially developing countries, the reason the global south has come together right now, and it was not coincidental, it happened uh, during our presidency of the G20, was a feeling that their interests and their concerns were being neglected when bigger players or different players were busy with their own fights. And therefore, how do I get, you know, um, how do I get hurt? Uh, and when 120 countries come together, you get hurt. So I, I think it made complete complete uh, sense. Thank you very much. There is, it's very clear. But one more question about the global south. What does it mean exactly for India? Is it like the non-alignment before? What what do you mean with the words multi-alignment? It seems to me that it's a big difference between the past non-aligned move, movement and multi-alignment, what is for India the meaning of these words? Okay, uh, I would distinguish between the two. Uh, I think global south, you know, there's a, you can say a smell test, okay? The countries of the global south know they are global south. Uh, they know they're global south. Most of them are decolonized countries. Most of them are developing countries. Uh, they have... Uh, today, in you know, income levels, they have positions, they have geographies, which, which kind of define them. So, so there is a, a you know, it's like if you have a community, people of the community know that they are in or that they are not part of it, and uh, their interests, their articulation, their sentiments, their solidarity, all of this is reflected uh, in that. So. Uh, it's, I would say, an intuitive gathering of countries who actually know why they are in that room and they have a feel uh, for, for each other. But I would differentiate between that and uh, multi-alignment uh, uh, because the multi-alignment issue is much more a policy, uh, uh, a policy perspective of countries who see in their diplomacy the need to have greater freedom of choices and to exercise those choices when, when required to do so by their national interest. Uh, and do not, in this world, want to be tied down to exclusive relationships. So uh, they, in, you know, in their view, and you know, we are a prime example of it, the range, your range of interests has become so broad uh, that uh, you you know on different issues you would have and sometimes different uh, theaters or regions you would have different partners but you don't want any one issue or any set of partners to uh, really exclude others so there is that uh, that uh, open architecture you can say of of the uh, foreign policy there uh, and uh, it's the countries who are more active the countries who in a way, have to bridge these divides more often. Who would tend to use this term? I don't, I don't think every country, for example, of the Global South would necessarily uh, go with that. Well, thank you very much. Very clear. Now, there is a club, the BRICS. Mm -hmm. uh, why this club? And do you consider that the BRICS will uh, expand? 
Well, uh, to be honest, why the club? Because there was another club. It was called the G7 and you wouldn't let anybody else into that club. So we said we go and form our own club. You know. uh, so we decided, okay, uh, you know, we are also, you know, good citizens of good standing who have a place uh, in, the, in the global society. And uh, therefore, uh, uh, this is how typically clubs multiply. Uh, so, uh, so it started, and as it started, uh, like many clubs, it gained a life of its own uh, over a period of time. Uh, others saw value in it as well. Uh, and uh, so, in a sense, I would say, uh, uh, I mean, it, it's actually a very interesting uh, group because if you look at it, uh, typically uh, any, any club or any group has either a geographical contiguity or some common historical experience or, uh, you know, a very strong economic connect. There is a, uh, th there are some orthodox binding factors. Uh, but when you have a Brazil uh, in South America and a Russia in Europe and India and China and Asia and later on South Africa was added, uh, the common feature was really, I would say, a uh, big, countries rising in the international system. Uh, R Russia perhaps had already risen, so would, would not necessarily qualify in that, uh, who felt that their coming together would give them greater weight and greater uh, influence. Now, what has happened between when the BRICS started approximately two decades ago to where we are now is we see, uh, particularly in the last few years, a lot of interest uh, in in you know countries uh, joining the grouping, uh, we expanded the BRICS. We took the decision to expand the BRICS uh, uh, last year in Johannesburg, uh, and uh, uh, we extended invitations to more countries, which virtually doubled the number. Uh, we will be meeting uh, soon in Kazan uh, next month. Uh, and uh, we know, I mean, as I, as I travel around the world, uh, I, I frankly see more and more uh, enthusiasm, you know, more, more interest really in countries wanting to be associated in some form or the other. Uh, BRICS, of course, has itself evolved. I mean, in all of this, we've also created a bank, uh, the New Development Bank. Uh, I think in, uh, different, uh, on different issues, we have collective positions, but there are many issues on which our interests also diverge. I mean, uh, India and Russia and China and uh, Brazil, South Africa would not, uh, you know, necessarily agree on all issues. And in, you know, in certain cases, maybe our positions can be quite diverse. Yes, thank you very much. No, I noted what you said about the uh, G7. I, I fully agree with you. Uh, but since then, uh, the G20 has been created. Mm -hmm. Uh, during the uh, financial crisis, and uh, it was a good answer uh, to uh, a difficult moment. Mm -hmm. And that's why, considered maybe from the north, we don't see why the BRICS was necessary, given the fact that the G20 exists. But I heard uh, your answer. Yeah, but you know, I must tell you, I'm still struck by how insecure the North is when uh, <laughs> when uh, you speak about the BRICS. So somehow, something seems to get under people's skin. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I, and here's an observation: uh, G7. You know, if there is a G20, did the G7 disband? Has it stopped meeting? No, it still continues. So, if the G20 exists, the G20 is there, but the G7 still exists then why can't the G20 be there and the BRICS also exist? So we're all constituents, I mean. Yeah, excellent answer as always. Thank you very much. Of course, one key question is about the relationship between India uh, and China. Mm -hmm. uh, we have seen uh, difficult uh, moments in the Himalaya on the border. Uh, we see a kind of competition in the Indian Ocean how would you describe the uh, relationship between China and India? Uh, I'll need a lot of adjectives. Uh, I mean, it's definitely a very complex relationship because uh, if you look at it, 
you know, these are uh, two civilizational states. They have a long history. Uh, they are also states who at various points of time in history were very big in the, in the uh, global economy, in the global society. Uh, they had bad periods in their history. Both of them are reviving, are, are rejuvenating in a way. And uh, uh, also as civilizational societies, they are, uh, you know, their, their uh, uh, borders, their uh, identity, their interests, these are getting, you know, more sharply defined, which happens in a, in a more modern age. Uh, and they are the only two countries which are, have a population of more than a billion. And what happens uh, uh, normally when any country rises uh, is it has ripple impact on the neighborhood. Now, these two countries also have the singular uh, uh, honor of being each other's neighbors. So each one's rise has a, has a ripple impact. They have a common neighborhood as well, and they are neighbors to each other. So if you look at all these factors, and, and they have different political systems, they have different economic systems. So if you take the totality of this, you can understand why I selected a safe but expressive word like uh, complex. Uh, we had, uh, you know, we've not uh, had an easy relationship in the past. It began reasonably well in the late 40s. Uh, there were frictions in the 50s, there was a war in 1962. Uh, then there was a period really from the late 50s till 19, uh, uh, I mean, for about 15 years, we didn't have an ambassador. We sent back an ambassador in 76. Uh, but it was only in the late 80s that really the relationship, you can say, normalized. Now, the basis for the normalization was that because we have a, a disputed border, the entirety of the border, which is almost 3,500 kilometers, is disputed uh, and is being negotiated. Uh, so the, the basis, obviously, for a, uh, for a, a good relationship, or a, I would say even a normal relationship, was that there would be peace and tranquility in the border. So after things began to take a better turn in 88, we had a series of agreements which, would, which stabilized the border. Then trade began, you know, more contacts, politicians, generals, tourists, all you know, what normally neighbors do. Now, what happened in 2020 was that in violation of uh, multiple agreements, uh, for some reason, which is still not entirely clear to us, we can speculate on it, uh, the Chinese actually moved a very large number of troops uh, to the line of uh, actual control uh, uh, at the border. Uh, and naturally, in response, we moved our troops up. This was a, it was very difficult for us because we were in the middle of a COVID lockdown at that time. They had come out of COVID, uh, that first round of COVID. Now, uh, we could see straight away that this was a very dangerous development because the presence of large number of troops in those extreme heights uh, and extreme cold uh, were, uh, in, in near proximity was could lead to a mishap. Uh, and that's exactly what happened uh, in June of uh, uh, 2020. Uh, so the issue for us is, uh, you know, uh, why they have uh, disturbed that peace and tranquility, why they moved those troops, uh, and uh, you know, how do you how do you now deal with this very close up situation? So we've been negotiating now for close to four years. Uh, and the first step of that is what we call disengagement, which is that their troops go back to the normal operating bases and our troops go back to our normal operating bases. And where required, we have an arrangement about patrolling because both of us patrol uh, regularly uh, in that border because, as I said, it's not a, uh, it's not a legally uh, delineated border. Uh, now... Uh, uh, the, those negotiations are going on. We made some progress. Uh, I would say roughly, you can say about 75% of the disengagement problems are sorted out. We still have some, some things to do. 
uh, but there's a bigger issue that you know if both of us have brought forces close up uh, and in that sense there's a level of militarization of the border has increased uh, how does one deal with it i think we have to deal with it but in the meanwhile after the clash it has affected actually the entirety of the relationship because you can't have uh, you know uh, violence on the border and then say the rest of the relationship is uh, insulated from it so trade has got affected uh, uh, and uh, the exchanges uh, have got affected uh, so it is it is not normal i mean to put it uh, very uh, politely uh, so uh, we we hope that the if there is a solution to the disengagement and there is a return to peace and tranquility then you know we, we can look at other other possibilities so that is the immediate issue but i think there are larger issues in respect of india china uh, we have long struggled with the trade issue uh, i've been ambassador in china so i can tell you from my time there uh, that we are talking you know 15 years ago uh, that uh, we feel that uh, the economic relationship with china has been very unfair it has been very imbalanced uh, that we don't have the market access there they have much better market access in, in india uh, we have concerns today uh, uh, again this is autonomous of of the border situation in in various areas you know technology in telecom in digital uh, and and those are issues and now as you have said we also uh, do monitor very carefully what happens in the indian ocean uh, so for us uh, any uh, radical shift uh, or uh, you know change of presence in the indian ocean is something we will take into our security calculus thank you very much uh, mr minister and i i think you are the best one to explain all this which is so important for all of us because not only you've been ambassador to Beijing, but you speak Chinese. Mm, well, no, I, I, I would you pass up on that. Yeah. Now, in this context, there is a, a rather new organization, the Indo-Pacific Quad, mm -hmm. with the US, India, Japan, and Australia. What is the role of this uh, institution? How do you see uh, the possibility maybe to enlarge it? This is one more club. <laughs> exactly and uh, it's uh, you know every club has a purpose every club has a context uh, uh, it uh, it restarted because it was first attempted in uh, 2007 and didn't work out for some reasons uh, then in 2017 after a 10 year gap it was restarted uh, and it has done well you know uh, because it was started at the level of uh, uh, the uh, uh, the secretary general, permanent secretary level in 17, it became ministerial in 19, uh, foreign minister. And then uh, in 21, it has become prime minister or president uh, level uh, meeting. It has also uh, uh, created a very large number of uh, activities and outcomes and collaborative uh, uh, sort of uh, initiatives. and. This span a very uh, sort of uh, broad range. I mean, it more it from 5G technology to connectivity to maritime domain awareness to providing vaccines to giving fellowships uh, to doing HADR operations together. So I would say today there would be at least maybe 25, 30 minimum, maybe even more than that, uh, different clusters of uh, activities. Uh, uh, under the quad uh, and uh, uh, certainly from our foreign policy perspective uh, it's it's been uh, a very big addition uh, to the sum total of what we do uh, globally uh, we hope in the coming days that we will have a, a quad summit uh, uh, in in the US uh, so that also tells you uh, you know how how important in a way it has uh, it has become uh, so, uh, in a, if you ask me why did it happen, again, as I said, you know, these four countries who are market economies, who are political democracies, who in many ways have common approach to international relations, at least 
and are comfortable with each other felt that are coming together would stabilize the Indo-Pacific region, uh, would uh, uh, create a, a climate of uh, predictability and stability and security, which is necessary for, for uh, continued growth and prosperity there. And I think when I look back, uh, you know, the last seven years, I think it was a, it was a very good, very wise decision uh, that we took. I, uh, you know, initially, like anything new which appears, uh, the way questions, you know, ASEAN countries, for example, wondered what does it, what implication does it have for them? Uh, but I would say with the passage of time, they, you know, there is a uh, increasing reassurance in much of the uh, Indo-Pacific that uh, actually this is a net uh, asset uh, to the region. And uh, uh, we certainly intend, and I, I sense the same with other Quad partners, we certainly intend to intensify it in the, in the times to come. Thank you very much. So this was looking east. If I look west, there is also a, a new promising development uh, with uh, the trilateral partnership. I may go a bit fast in mentioning that, but between India, the GCC countries and Europe, a famous corridor. <laughs> How would you describe the perspectives of these uh, new development? I noted that before coming to Geneva, you went to Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. and then to Germany. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, we agreed on this corridor last September on the sidelines of the uh, UN uh, of the G20. Uh, now it's it's very interesting. Uh, I remember speaking to the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, uh, and uh, what he described in many ways was. Actually, even today, there are uh, townships in Saudi Arabia which uh, remember and have internalized the movement of Indians and, you know, they have names and they have habits and they have uh, dress uh, uh, sort of uh, adoption, which shows really how deep, you know, the trade history uh, was in that part of the world. Okay, so uh, the fact is, uh, I mean, if you were to, let us say, go back 2000 years, uh, at that time, I'm using this for convenience, let us say the Roman Empire at one end and India on the other, two big economic centers would have actually had their trade uh, go through the Arabian Peninsula, cross the Mediterranean and go across and vice versa. Now, for a variety of reasons, it got interrupted. In some ways, even when it was resumed, uh, it had a modern incarnation. I mean, the Suez Canal is one example of that. Uh, but today, what has happened, uh, and you know, uh, this is a larger point. Uh, if you if you look at the uh, implications of the COVID, uh, if you look at what the anxieties which arise from conflicts. Uh, if you factor in the, the regular occurrence of extreme climate events, what all big economies want to do is they want to de-risk. You know, they want to de-risk their economic exposure. And one important part of that de-risking is to have more, connect, more, more corridors, more connectivity. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, uh, this was actually something which came out uh, between us, the the Saudis especially, but the UAE was also involved with some European countries and a very important player, uh, European countries included France, Germany, Italy, uh, which were the United States. I mean, the United States also felt strongly about it and was prepared to contribute to it and underwrite it in many respects. Uh, so uh, that's how this idea came about. Now, uh, unfortunately, what happened was uh, soon within a month, the events of October 7th, uh, and then the, uh, the conflict in Gaza, which started after that. So it has, uh, 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 in a way, the, I would say there's, there's been a dampening effect in terms of the immediate action, but it's not like nothing has happened. Uh, in fact, uh, we have even uh, in Saudi Arabia, for example, 
I, I was uh, discussing with them. We are looking at a study on uh, power grids, which we are doing with them. Uh, with UAE, we have begun uh, some activities on ports and uh, logistics on either end. So uh, I'd be honest, uh, it uh, clearly the, uh, the Gaza conflict and all the uncertainties have slowed us down. But I, I think there is a fundamental logic to this collaboration. Uh, and, uh, you know, at some stage, uh, this will, uh, you know, take, take, uh, take over. Uh, so I, I do expect as and when, you know, things recede that there will be a big pickup. But even if it doesn't, I mean, I think some degree of activities, preparatory activities would continue. But there is a lot of interest uh, here, uh, you know, and, and this new connectivity. And there are many such enterprises today uh, in the world that, uh, I mean, if you look at multi-alignment, for example, we have also a connectivity initiative through Iran and Russia. Uh, on the other side, we have a polar connectivity. We even have a land connectivity from India to Vietnam, which we are trying to get through Myanmar. So uh, multi-alignment is also expressed in connectivity today in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now, one question about the relationship between India and the European Union. We'll have soon a new EU Commission in, in Brussels. What is the most important for you, the relationship with Brussels, the relationship with Germany, with France, both? And are you optimistic about the possibility to sign in the coming months, let's say, a free trade agreement between the EU and India? Well, since you asked the question, I have to say the relationship with France is very important. <laughs> Uh, so, but it's true. It's, it's a fact as well. Uh, and uh, so it is with Germany, uh, which is our largest uh, trade partner. But in reality, uh, you know, uh, what, uh, what had happened to us, and, and this is our own, uh, in a way, uh, um, perhaps uh, analytical or operational uh, deficiency in the past, we largely dealt with the big European nation states, even though the EU became deeper and deeper. So if you looked at Indian foreign policy, say 15 years ago, 20 years ago, it would be centered around a France or Germany or UK, perhaps uh, Italy or Spain. Now, uh, that underwent a change uh, uh, over the last decade. So uh, those relationships, bilateral relationships continue. But we have invested an enormous amount of time and effort uh, with the commission. I mean, I suspect, I mean, uh, in my own tenure, probably I've dealt more with the commission than all my predecessors put together. And that's not because of me. It is because once there is a realization of the importance uh, of the commission. Uh, we've also uh, created mechanisms. You know, we are one of the two countries with whom the EU has a trade and technology council. The other one is the United States. Uh, we are seeking to revive our free trade agreement. You know, we had negotiated it. Then there were some problems. It didn't get signed. Then the start restarting the negotiations was an issue, but it started under a uh, von der Leyen. Uh, and uh, the uh, FTA, the investment treaty, the geographical indications agreement, these are all right now under negotiations. Uh, am I confident of doing it in the next few months? You know, uh, I, I thought we were difficult as a bureaucracy, but I can assure you Brussels is a good competitor uh, in this respect. So when two difficult bureaucracies negotiate with each other, I think you'd, it would be fair to uh, not press me on a on a timeline uh, timeline here. Uh, but for us, I, I want to say, you know, uh, Europe as a whole, European Union and Europe, and I'm here in a non-EU country, we did an EFTA with the EFTA, uh, FTA uh, just a few months ago. Uh, uh, if you look today at our engagement, the engagement with the EU collectively has gone up. We have an engagement with different uh, subgroupings within the EU, the Nordics, for example. Uh, so we engage the Nordics at the prime minister's level. I engage the Nordics Baltics at my level. 
Uh, we engage the Central Europeans as a distinct uh, grouping. Uh, we are looking, uh, we do the Mediterranean. Uh, in fact, I just uh, last week had the first India Mediterranean business uh, uh, conference. So uh, what we have done is we have really stepped up our uh, uh, engagement with Europe. And there are two, three reasons for it. One, uh, we do think a stronger partnership can accelerate our national growth and development. Europe has resources, it has technology, it has uh, best practices, which would be very useful to us. Uh, secondly, we welcome Europe in a way as, a, as one of the poles of a multipolar world. I mean, we do see a strategic awakening in Europe. I think recent developments have made Europeans much more conscious about themselves and the world. Uh, and I think that's a net asset really to the world. I mean, we, we want a strong Europe. We want a more contributing Europe and certainly Europe with which we'd like a bigger partnership. And third, we find Europe in many ways actually very uh, uh, a very uh, forward looking partner on some of the big issues. You know, uh, yes, there are some issues on which we have strong differences like CBAM, but uh, on by and large on say, I, I was in Germany yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a green and sustainable development partnership with Germany. There are a lot of projects which have moved forward uh, on that. We are lo today looking at areas like uh, semiconductors uh, uh, and uh, electric mobility as, as uh, areas of partnership. It's also, by the way, a very uh, uh, interesting partner in terms of mobility of Indian talent. That if you, you know, when I, we look at the world today, increasingly we look at the world as a global workplace. Uh, and in that global workplace for us, the legal mobility of people, their fair treatment when they go out uh, in the world, the opportunities that they get there, I think all these are important for us. And this deeper engagement with Europe has actually helped very much in terms of uh, mobility. I mean, we, we see a certain welcome of Indian talent and skills. And we understand this is happening at a time when there are actually difficult immigration debates going on in this continent. Well, thank you very much for these uh, very positive words. And I reciprocate. Uh, we thank have you. exactly the same positive view about the rise of India as a key partner for, for Europe. Uh, you mentioned the mobility of uh, Indian talents. And I'm impressed by the success story of uh, Indian citizens in the US. Mm -hmm. If uh, you look at the list of the CEOs of the most successful uh, companies uh, in California, most of them are from Indian origin, not to mention a candidate uh, to the top job uh, in the uh, US. Uh, how do you explain these uh, success stories? And uh, do you see these success stories are transforming the image of India all over the world? Uh, well, look, I would say the reasons why many Indians have been so successful uh, in the US is that uh, in India itself, uh, India is a very competitive place. You know, uh, so uh, if you grow up in a, I would say almost a hyper competitive environment and in a society where really education is the pathway of mobility, uh, then uh, you, you there's a certain mindset which is which is built into you. Uh, coming to a, a place like the US where there are opportunities, where there is a, a performance reward correlation uh, where there's a possibility of where the hierarchy is less rigid. Uh, I think this competitiveness then becomes a great asset. Uh, you know, these are people for them now, this environment is really very friendly and very rewarding for all the attributes which they have already acquired in India and brought to bear as, uh, as immigrants. So uh, I would say in many ways, that's, you know, uh, there, it, it can express itself in different ways. I mean, you would say uh, we are probably the, uh, in terms of education, uh, the most qualified uh, minor, minority group or a hyphenated uh, 
uh, nationality group in in the in the us but those are derivatives of that fundamental uh, competitiveness uh, you know to some extent speaking english again uh, helps uh, indians by and large are also much more adaptable you know so so they are able to uh, adjust uh, we see that even even in europe i mean when i was in germany yesterday uh, i i got from the german politicians uh, i actually got a lot of warm words about indian communities how well they adjust and contribute even in small german towns and uh, villages so uh, i would say that's the fundamental reason but uh, also bear in mind that this happened the take off point was really the dot com revolution the h1b visa the fact that a lot of skilled indians or technically you know smart indians went there then they created a pathway it opened up things more of them uh, came in so uh, yes silicon valley but uh, i i would say today if you look at you know even education you look at businesses you look at finance uh, today i mean uh, every uh, private equity you know is full of indians uh, uh, out there uh, so so the, and there are perhaps some cultural attributes as well fascinating uh, we discussed the different elements of this uh, changing world order but of course, we have not yet discussed Geneva, uh -huh. New York. Okay. At the end of September, uh, there will be a, a summit about the future yes. in uh, New York. Mm -hmm. And of course, it is of major importance for the global issues which cannot be solved by different elements which need that we work together, climate change and so on and so forth. Are you optimistic about this summit at the end of September in New York? Uh, look, uh, I think uh, a concern for us, which we would like to take into that summit, is that uh, the as a result of the COVID, as a result of global economic developments, conflicts, you know, all the stresses on the international system, uh, actually, the world has fallen behind very significantly in its pursuit of uh, SDGs. It's a very big concern. Yeah. You know, I travel a fair amount to uh, Africa and I, I can, you know, every, every place I go to, I hear that story of shrinking budgets, of uh, inability to, you know, even keep up the pace which they were doing uh, before the COVID. Uh, so we do think that there are some very crucial issues that the summit of the future uh, needs to look at. Now, it's not like there are no solutions. I mean, there are solutions. I mean, uh, one which we can offer from our own experience, for example, is uh, the, the deployment of a digital public infrastructure and what an impact it makes in terms of the quality of governance, in terms of the efficiency of uh, public services uh, in terms of actually attacking poverty that today if in india you know we are able you know week after week month after month to actually target about 830 million people and say these are the 830 million people who are deserving of food support or those are the 630 million people who should get free health access. We can only do it because we have a digital backbone that we have painstakingly created. But once you have done something like this, I mean, it's amazing how you can, you know, uh, purpose it for, for uh, different events. So if you look at it, you know, today our elections are fairer, uh, our uh, public services are better, our corruption is less, uh, the the you know ease of living for people is very different and all of it is because of this digital so uh, we think you know digital sdg issues global governance issues resources issues uh, solutions like and i'm giving you this as an example in different areas uh, so there is a lot there for uh, for uh, the world to look at you know i i'm not uh, in any way diminishing the seriousness of some of the other challenges that we face. Yes, there are very major conflicts going on. I mean, it's a long, long time in the world 
where we've had two big conflicts, both of, uh, you know, such a large ripple implication happening simultaneously. Yes, it is, it is crucial. But these should not make us forget what are the uh, really bread and butter, life and death issues for a whole lot of countries. And that's really where we want to see that focus. Yeah, thank you very much. And of course, when I speak about New York and the UN, there is also the Security Council. Mm -hmm. As you know, Mr. Minister, the UK and France are very much in favor of the enlargement of the Security Council, including for the permanent members. We uh, think that India should be a permanent member. We think that uh, Brazil, Germany, uh, Japan should be permanent members, and certainly two African countries, up to them to decide which one, which is a sensitive issue. Do you think that we will succeed in changing the rules in New York, enlarging the Security Council in both categories? Well, look, uh, Ambassador, you had far more direct experience of this than I've had. Uh, and you know, the reality is there is overall, I think, widespread and deep sentiment for change. Okay. Now, the countries who are opposed to the change, who have a vested interest in the status quo, have actually been very smart about it. So what they do is to diffuse that desire for change. They, they try to say, let us settle the details before we agree on whether there should be change or not. I mean, that's really putting the cart before the horse. So what happens is you drag it down and then, you know, if you, if you look at uh, some of these negotiations, you know, the intergovernmental negotiations, for a long time, it doesn't have a text. Now, can you show me one negotiation in global history where you actually had a negotiation without a text? You know, I mean, that itself tells you something. So what we have seen is this kind of foot dragging, you know, diversion, you know, let's, uh, it's like we haven't agreed on it. We can't talk about it because we haven't agreed on it. Now, it should be the other way around. Unless you talk about it, unless you put proposals on the table, unless you debate it, it's supposed to be a democratic body. People should vote on it. You know, So this idea that something is not possible because all of us have not, you know, consensus, for example, is a concept which is being used as, a, as an obstruction. So, uh, so I, I think that there is a sense, I mean, there is a certain impatience I can see building. And, uh, you know, it's very difficult to predict which way it would go. But in, you know, there are many other changes which are also happening. I mean, for example, this even the idea now that every time you cast a veto, you have to go to the General Assembly and explain it. It's going to have a long term consequence. So change is going to come, you know, people blocking it, you're really like fighting the waves, but they are doing it. I mean, we also need to recognize that and try to find ways of, uh, of overcoming. No, I totally agree with you. And we need the UN in great shape to yep. address yep. the major issues of today and tomorrow. Now it's time to turn to uh, the questions coming from the audience. I have them under my eyes. The first one, and it is said there are many questions on Ukraine. And the first two are in the context of a recent visit of Prime Minister Modi mm -hmm. to Russia and Ukraine and his willingness to work towards a peaceful solution. Could you share anything about these efforts? And the second one, how does India see the China-Brazil common understandings on the war in Ukraine? Um, I'll put it together. Um, first, let me explain what our thinking is uh, uh, on Ukraine. Uh, one, we have always held the belief that while there can be differences and disputes between neighbors, uh, this in this in this era it should not be settled through war and through violence okay. and we have said this publicly number two uh, unfortunately that has happened 
but we do not believe that a solution is going to come from the battlefield. Now, once you accept that there will not be a solution from the battlefield, which means neither side is able to decisively impose a, a verdict on the other, then logically there has to be a negotiation. If there is a negotiation, or when there is a negotiation, then you have to have all the parties or the concerned parties at the negotiation. You know, a negotiation cannot be one party and all its supporters coming together and the other party not in the room. Then it's not a negotiation. So we uh, feel today that a time has arrived when there should be a realization that the continuation of this conflict is hurting both countries. It is hurting the region. It is hurting the world. Uh, and the sooner it ends, the better off we all are. But it is not our place to, you know, to suggest terms and tell them what they should. It's their country at the end of it all. Uh, it, that is for them to decide. So uh, what happened was in July, uh, Prime Minister Modi went to, uh, to Russia. Uh, it was his first visit to Russia after uh, the war started in Ukraine. Uh, he had long meetings, a very, very detailed discussion with President Putin. Many things were said, understood. And uh, uh, before that, uh, a few weeks before that, he had actually met President Zelensky in Italy, in Puglia, at the G7. So he went, uh, uh, so after the meeting in Moscow, uh, there was also a discussion, and you know, the Russian side was open to sharing some of this discussion and some ideas in it with the Ukrainian side. We had already told President Zelensky in June that we were contemplating coming to Kiev. So it made sense then in the month of August to go to Kiev, which is what we did. So we sat down with President Zelensky and his core team. And then we had again uh, a discussion there. Uh, now, uh, uh, in a in a sense, some of what we discussed here, we shared there and the other way around. Uh, and uh, since then, uh, our national security advisor has gone back to Moscow uh, to loop Russia back in on whatever was discussed uh, in, in Ukraine. So I come back to this proposition that... Uh, we are not going to get a military solution. Uh, if there isn't a military solution, there has to be a diplomatic one, a negotiated one. If there is a negotiated one, the parties have to decide when, where, how, what process, what terms. It's for the parties to decide. We can have a view on it, but it's their call eventually. But in this process, if there is anything that we can do, we can, uh, you know, Say, I heard this here, what do you think about it there? Or, you know, there are things which they said to us, but they don't want to tell you this officially, but they would like to know what is your thinking. I think those are possibilities. And uh, my sense uh, after, uh, you know, uh, talking to uh, some European colleagues, uh, uh, including when I was in Germany, um, talking to because you know some of the gulf countries have also been active saudi arabia and uae in particular and i, I was there as well uh, and uh, even among many of the other uh, you know many of our friends and partners in asia uh, there is an interest you know uh, the world would like a few countries who have the ability to talk in both places who can who are not seen as in one country as being in the other party's camp uh, I think these countries have a possibility today. You know, uh, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, we will not have done any harm. But I think at this time, uh, some interest, some some kind of uh, movement, I suspect is in our collective interest. Thank you very much. Now, next question from the audience. India has been a leader in driving the notion of soft diplomacy as compared to other forms of diplomacy, what are the benefits of this approach and how does it give India a competitive edge? Uh, you know, you, you do soft diplomacy for two reasons. Uh, one, 
uh, actually to be to do good you know you you are trying to spread things uh, i i would i would give you yoga as an example you know uh, or music you know you don't do music because you want a competitive edge you 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 want everybody to be happy okay you do yoga you want everybody to be healthy you advocate millets because you want everybody to be better fed and more nutritious so i think there's a genuine global good side to the soft power of all countries certainly today we think that there is a lot in our culture and heritage and traditions which if we explain it communicate it and practice it well before the world well, we think it will make a big difference you know and it may look very small when it starts i mean i remember the time when uh, prime minister modi you know shared with us this was in 2014 on his first visit to the un saying can we actually get the un to pass a resolution on yoga uh, and i must confess in all honesty that the diplomats were more skeptical uh, than he was but when i now look at it you know 10 years later and i see really what a huge impact it's had uh, across the world you know uh, when we do the international day of yoga we start we actually have from the international dateline one end we beam programs there's not a single country in the world where uh, you know there isn't a yoga event so and uh, or if i were to give you you know what we did last year which was millets uh, because millets uh, you know was the older grain for many societies it's a more nutritious grain most important it consumes less water it grows in arid areas it has a smaller carbon footprint so when we started propagating millets uh, i was actually surprised how much traction for example we got in africa because most africans also eat millets now it's just that the millet culture because the wheat and rice were so overpowering that they drove the, the millets was like the poor guy's subsistence you know you made it you ate it you threw it away nobody made it took it to the markets made other products out of it played it up and said you know this is this is great food so once we started going around the world and saying millets is super food you know look at it i can tell you there were a lot of others who felt the same but they needed somebody to start start this up so there's one part of that but the other part of it is yes in all of this you build an image you know there's a there's a perception of a country or a society or a people i mean you had for example a perception you know indians hard working people successful silicon valley look at it in a way that soft power at work you know these people by going there doing well themselves have created a collective image of the you know uh, hard working uh, sort of thrifty family centric uh, you know contributive uh, socially conscious in so it it helps us yeah thank you very much Next question from uh, the audience which are the hot spots of geopolitics that causes india the most concern nowadays i think that's pretty obvious you know the same as everybody else uh, but you know for for some more different reasons uh, when i mean we've spoken about ukraine at some length and uh, if you look at ukraine the conflict and this is actually tells you today how interdependent and globalized and tightly woven we have become uh when the fighting started uh, it had an immediate impact on the world food market so look, especially on wheat okay it had a immediate impact on fuel prices okay uh, it actually shifted a lot of the Uh, it created a disturbance in the global logistics in the global economy uh, in global finance to to some degree many of the sanctions which e eu contemplated had collateral yeah. consequences on other societies so you actually had uh, you know uh, this is this is not so well realized maybe in this part of the world many of the consequences of this conflict were actually felt far far away Uh, i mean we looked at our own neighborhood uh, in sri lanka 
you know, Sri Lanka was struggling through problems, but those problems were massively, in, you know, they, they were like multiplied because immediate, I mean, I, we, we had just negotiated uh, support for a certain amount of fuel uh, for Sri Lanka to import. The moment the conflict happened, literally, I'm not exaggerating, the amount of fuel came down by half because the cost of fuel doubled. So, so a lot of the crisis in Sri Lanka, the tipping point were actually secondary or tertiary consequences of what was happening in Ukraine. So my point is today, uh, in a way you can say uh, uh, conflict anywhere actually can create instability everywhere. It's not so obvious. It's, it's, it's a, ref uh, you know, a reflection of that tight linkage we have. And for us today, what is happening uh, in the Middle East, in Gaza, uh, uh, I think is, is a major concern because uh, it's affecting shipping. You know, the, the Houthi targeting of shipping has big consequences. Uh, it has uh, radicalization implications. Um, uh, and uh, we, we have a big uh, community in the Middle East. I mean, if you take the Middle East and the Gulf put together, we will be somewhere around between 9 to 10 million people. So, so, yeah. so, you know, and, and then of course there's energy, there's, there's a lot of other economic consequences. So my point is every global hotspot today, I mean, here is the paradox. Okay. At one level, because of all those changes I described at the start, there's less global appetite to go and do somebody else's problem. But the fact is that somebody else's problem can come back into your home much faster than you think. And this, I think, is one of the paradoxes we confront, yeah. which is the real world, the real economy is more globalized. Unfortunately, the multilateral world is weaker and less globalized. Yeah. And this gap, I would argue, is one of the big concerns. And this is one of the reasons why we need a more effective multilateral system and a more reformed UN. Yeah, we totally agree on that. And I think all the audience is in agreement uh, with you on that. Maybe last question, if you agree. As a career diplomat, when did you see a significant change in India's foreign policy as India rises? Uh, that's a, that's a, um, you know, it's not an easy one because it wasn't a single, single issue. Uh, you know, 1992, was a very difficult year for us because we were looking at a very major economic crisis. Uh, and many of the reforms that we did then, uh, I think uh, served us very well. Uh, then I would move to 1998, which was for years we, we had this, you know, uh, ambivalence. Um, I would actually say the ambivalence was really indecision. Uh, on becoming a nuclear weapon power. I think it was important that we cross that Rubicon because today, uh, in many ways, it, it enables us to deal with, you know, competitive forces in a much more uh, confident and uh, assured manner. I would say thereafter, it's been uh, very much more evolutionary. You know, it's, it's hard to say that year there was a, decisive change. But all in all, to me, the last 10 years have been important. And, you know, obviously, I have a political partiality in making that statement. But I would still say why I think those 10 years have been important is at home. Uh, we are doing the reforms uh, that we should, not just the ones we must. That, you know, we're not saying our backs are to the wall, so let me do something. We are actually doing things, looking ahead, planning for the future, saying, you know, if I put a semiconductor industry in place, it means this. If I do logistics, it means this. If I double the number of, you know, universities and colleges, that gives me a better place. Now, these are not changes which are compelled. These are changes which are strategized. And to me, that gives me a lot of hope about what we can do because I can visibly see our domestic capacities increasing. These external is uh, as the capacities grow and as you know with with the change of leadership i think there's a much greater confidence 
in actually uh, uh, in in addressing the world and i would say this today if you go around the world let's be honest in most countries foreign policy is not popular you know people don't want to do more they don't i mean uh, when foreign ministers meet the common topic is how the budgets have shrunk okay i mean it's it's a it's a common gripe of foreign ministers we have to battle for your budget okay i see the reverse in my country i mean there is an appetite to do more with the world there is a sense of responsibility to the world you know if you look i mean look at for example our first responder uh, operations i mean we could take the view saying we are a 3000 dollar per capita country so why should i send ships to the uh, gulf of aden you know or why should i send a responder team to an earthquake in turkey or whatever you know depending on but there is today i mean if i describe to you a sentiment in the country today in my country today foreign policy is popular dealing more with the world is popular people feel both an obligation and a sense of pride uh, uh, about that and that's for me been evolutionary but you know it's human nature every 10 years you kind of look back and say okay where are we compared and i think to me that's been hugely uh, encouraging well minister it's a privilege to be with you today it's been fascinating conversation thank you for the audience for your questions but mr minister thank you for your answers you are a star in the world and uh, i express the gratitude of all the audience thank you very much